Unusually for a tech company, Newsom's got a long tradition of jumping into cold water. I was a, a sad case, I'm afraid. I used to go into school with a briefcase and a Mac. I used to tell people when I was 10 or 11 that I was going to be a businessman. I think the beauty about technology is I'm still doing physiotherapy, it's just on a larger scale. I like to think we're a wee bit better than everybody else, that's it. I come to work every day to grow a business and look for new products and new angles. And I suppose if that's entrepreneurship, then I would class myself as an entrepreneur. 24 nominees, 24 stories of business excellence, all competing to become the EY Entrepreneur of the Year 2016. While working with patients suffering from Parkinson's disease, physiotherapist and former dancer Kira Clancy developed Beats Medical, a smartphone app that brings established treatments out of the consulting room and into people's pockets. The app uses metronome therapy, a beat individualised for each user each day to help with some of the symptoms of Parkinson's. Dance is a very powerful activity in Parkinson's disease and what is causing that is that beat that underlays that music. What Beats Medical does is almost like that concentrated form of dance, that concentrated dose each day of that beat. As you can see in the class here, people with Parkinson's, they may have some issues with movement, but move very fluidly throughout a dance class and get that freedom of movement that the metronome beat, which Beats Medical provides, but also dance and music can have a powerful impact too. With Parkinson's, your body is still kind of tense within itself. That you think, I'll never be able to go, whoosh. And the dancing allows you to free yourself up, become a ballet dancer, you know. That's what you long for. I long for that ability to lie down and feel totally at ease with your body. For the past 14 years, broadcaster and musician Shay Healy has been one of 10 million people worldwide battling the symptoms of Parkinson's while getting on with life and his first love, music. So on this one, you're going to swing the arms, look ahead and try and set the feet on time. I try to do something musical every day, writing a song or whatever. And um, they've helped me very much. It made me stay away from television, though. I stopped making TV programmes. So that was an impediment in my life. And it was impinging on me in ways I didn't like. But I'm still mobile, I'm still moving and walking, not very far, but I can walk. So every day's a bonus, and, uh, and the people are a lot worse off with Parkinson's than I am. OK, so we're going to do the signature size one, so you're going to bring it around the earth. Yeah, that's it. So originally we aimed to tackle the mobility symptoms, such as shortened shuffling steps and sometimes freezing stuck on the spot. But our new treatments now also help with some of the speech issues that people with Parkinson's face and difficulties with fine hand movements, doing things such as buttons and zippers. These are symptoms that all persist despite medication, but for which allied health therapy and different exercises can have a powerful impact on. The therapies that feature on Beats Medical App have been around since the 1950s and have proven benefits. But advances in smartphone technology made it possible for Kira to bridge the gap between the consulting room and the boardroom and develop the business. I suppose I didn't come into this planning to be an entrepreneur. That was never the plan growing up. One thing I really wanted to be was a physiotherapist. When you're studying physiotherapy, you're not maybe thought financial modelling. <laughs> um, and you might not be thought uh, um, raising funding or, or much of that. Um, but it's funny the skills that actually you do bring to the fore. One of the things that we have in, in physiotherapy is differential diagnosis. It's a diagnosis by ruling out what it isn't and then finding out what it is. And I've had a number of scenarios in Beats Medical where I've only realised halfway through while I was doing a problem solving, as it would be called in business, that I was actually doing differential diagnosis. I was saying, right, it's not this, it's not this, it's not this, okay, it's this, let's try this. Let's reevaluate, reflect, did that treatment work or did that solution work? So I think there's actually a lot of the skills that I learned in physio that sometimes do come to the fore. I think the beauty about technology is I'm still doing physiotherapy, it's just on a larger scale. That to me is somewhat of a dream come true to be able to provide treatment around the world daily to more people than I could have helped alone. Newswhip are in the business of finding the stories on the internet that are about to hit the headlines. Constantly monitoring social networks on the web, Newswhip provides clients from the BBC to number 10 Downing Street with information on which stories are being shared the most in real time. For Andrew Milani and Paul Quigley, 
Timing is everything. <laughs> We're at Dublin's famous 40-foot bathing spot. And unusually for a tech company, Newsom's got a long tradition of jumping into cold water. Uh, very first time we successfully raised money as a bet, we jumped off a bridge into the Grand Canal in Dublin. Since then we've been swimming in the Atlantic with our staff and had a lot of cold water adventures together. Based in Dublin, Newswhip is a partnership between technologist Andrew and former lawyer with a passion for news, Paul. I always loved media, so way back when, as a transition year project in fact, I started a newspaper called the Castle Foy Times. Um, Great distribution method. I have my little brother um, to give it out into the letterboxes. Uh, then you can sell ads in it. So as long as you were selling enough ads to pay for the printing and you've added your own time at zero, you could make money. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, soon you realize that's not a good idea and you've got to value your own time too. But within a couple of issues, it became quite profitable. Newsflip's like a fantastically more ambitious project again because what we want to do with Newsflip is find what are the most interesting stories in the whole world and try and find really quickly which ones are the important ones and get that to people who need to know about it. It just made so much sense because everyone was moving from the, you know, the traditional newspaper to, uh, to, to engaging this stuff on social networks and it was real time and it was actually possible now for a technology to analyse how I was doing this before because if I read this paper here there's no way to measure that but uh, we could measure this and we could do it really, really quickly. So, uh, and we could do it at scale. We could do it for the whole planet, which is just amazing. People share the content they care about. And when a lot of people do that at one time, a story spikes. Clients like Spin in Dublin use Newswhip's Spike software to filter the results and get advance warning of stories that will resonate with their listeners. The alternative, what people used to do before, was buy a newspaper and find, okay, which stories in the newspaper might be interesting today, or be on Twitter and kind of hope that the right thing comes to you. you know, I find that our audience, you know, if it's an hour old, they consider that old news. So mm -hmm. we need to be on the ball all the time. One of the assumptions people have about what gets shared is that it's all cats and it's all dumb stuff. And what we've found really interesting is that's not the case at all. People share stuff that's important to them. Basically, we, we build our own custom discovery algorithms that go out into the internet and, and, and find new content that hasn't existed before. We have three million pieces of news each day. After that, then we go to the social networks and we pull all this raw data information about how these things have been performing. And then is where the magic happens. We use all our algorithms to mix all this stuff up and find the signal that our users need. What I like about starting your own business is that you, you know, you're answerable for everything. There's no one external who you can blame. There's no external system you can be annoyed with. And you've got to accept reality the way it is and try and build something that fits into that and that can be really useful within, within the environment. Growing up in the countryside, Jim Wright hasn't ventured far from his roots with JMW Farms, a major pig producer with an annual turnover of £40 million. With breeding farms spread across Ireland, North and South and the UK, work life is busy, but home life might be even busier for this country lad. We just finished the stables in the springtime and the arena was finished last autumn. So we've got about maybe six ponies down there now. So we're getting the big way into ponies. So it's good for the girls, really good. This is Maisie and Penny and this is Diane, my wife, and Jasmine and this one's Sophie and that's, that's the whole lot. A really busy, busy house is right. So we'll have some wee moods in this house now. <laughs> Any pig farmers in this bunch? There's one. <laughs> are you, you going to be a pig farmer music? Mm hmm. Jim began growing pigs at the tender age of 14 with his first two pigs. Now JMW Farms finishes 7,000 pigs a week. This scale requires attention to detail and meticulous control of every stage of the process. With their own transport fleet, feed mill and power plant, JMW feed everything from the pigs to the farm itself on their own terms. We're in a field of whole crop rye here. We're growing this crop as an energy crop to feed the anaerobic digester, which is producing electric, which on this site is running the feed mill and running the farm 
and what's, what electric we don't use is exported onto the grid. The AD plant is more or less producing what electric it takes to run 4,000 homes. So that just gives you an idea of the amount of electric that's producing. Pig production is an incredibly competitive market and Jim has always paid attention to market trends to maintain JMW's advantage. The research farm, for instance, is currently focused on producing antibiotic-free pork for consumers. I love it. It's, it's not work to me. I love to, I love to get at it. That's, that's hobby and job in one. This is a jerk. It's a Canadian jerk that we brought in to try to give us a tougher pig. And hopefully this pig will go through its lifetime not needing any antibiotics. Hopefully it'll grow as fast and do as well as the other ones. We have now got two of our farms producing pigs antibiotic free. So that has took about three years to get there. And we've got there really by having the feed just right, full control of the feed, the health and the genetics as well. Those three things, when we get that right, we feel we can produce pigs without any antibiotics. That's how you're meant to pick a pig up. My mother, that's where I learned how to look after pigs properly. Good pig. They have to beg me to go into the office every so often. I, this, is, this is where I want to be, not at a desk. If anybody asks me what I do, I'm a farmer. I'm still a farmer. I like to think we're a wee bit better than everybody else in this business. That gives us a wee advantage. And we now have a scale that we can have our own feed mill, we can have our own transport. We have everything covered. So advice from me would be just be a wee bit better than everybody else. That's, that's it. character has been shaped by our agricultural roots, yet Ireland also has a rich heritage of business innovation. Harry Ferguson from County Down invented a revolutionary tractor linkage system and in the process he popularised tractor ownership for smallholders. We have a great tradition of innovation and disruption in Ireland and Harry Ferguson is a great example not only with agricultural machinery but he also developed the first four-wheel drive system put into a Formula One car driven by the Rob Walker racing team. And his first passion was aviation. He was the first Irishman to build and fly his own plane. And I think he'd be incredibly proud of how Ryanair, a, a great example of disrupting a, an industry. You know, Europe's first low cost uh, airline, now Europe's biggest by both volume and passenger numbers. They really had a tremendous culture of saying, we don't accept the norm, we're going to change this and change it for the benefit of customer needs. Disruptive innovation is a term coined at Harvard which explains how new ideas can transform an industry. There is a point beyond which consumers won't pay for new or improved versions of existing products. Enter the disruptive innovators who create good enough products to attract away customers and create new markets. It's not good enough to just say, I want to be a disruptor, great, how are you going to do that? That if you understand why people make the choices they make to bring a product or service into their life, you're understanding in effect the job that they're hiring that product or service to do for them. If I asked you who was a competitor to PlayStation, Sony PlayStation, you might instantly think Xbox, right? That's how the media reports it. There's their side-by-side -side competition, how they're pricing themselves. But if I said, in what world is a bottle of wine or a pint of Ben & Jerry's ice cream, a competitor to Xbox. How is that possible? Well, it is. It's for, in my house, it's a competitor for being hired for the job of help me relax after a stressful day at work. It's a totally different way of thinking about why people choose to do what they do. And if you have the job in mind, you'll see your competition in a completely different way than if you're just thinking inside of traditional industry categories. The job of online payments was turned on its head by Limerick brothers Patrick and John Collison with their company Stripe. As archetypes of disruptive entrepreneurs, they created a multi-billion dollar business that crucially makes it easier than ever to start selling online. 
the core of entrepreneurship is wanting sort of the world to be different in some kind of discreet way. Normally it's you're really annoyed by sort of the way such and such thing works and you think it should work in this other way, right? The characteristics of, of disruptors tend to be they don't accept the norm and the way of doing things. The other thing I think they have in common is they have this great belief that they can improve things. These entrepreneurs don't just see one way of doing things, they recognise there's not just an alternative way, but there's invariably a better way. Not long after leaving school, Colin Cullerton opened his first printing shop. As printing budgets stalled, Colin grew the business to encompass a five-company graphic, design and marketing group, TPI, in Dublin. Turnover this year will be 15 million euros. I was a sad case, I'm afraid. I used to go into school with a briefcase and a Mac. I used to tell people when I was 10 or 11 that I was going to be a businessman. I never even heard the word entrepreneur. All I wanted to be was a successful businessman. I told anybody that would listen that I'd be a millionaire by the time I was 21, and I wasn't. Um, so 22 was a difficult year. It didn't really matter to me what the business was, and actually we, I just fell into the printing business just as I got a job in that area. I just like the idea of being my own success or failure. I have no problem in making a mistake and I have no problem in going down the wrong road, but I prefer it to be my own road rather than somebody else telling me what to do. When the downturn hit marketing budgets and print orders slumped, Colin had to pivot the business into providing other design products. Now the company employs 135, providing a full suite of marketing, graphics and design services. At the Glen Royal Hotel in Maynooth, Colin is casting an eye over one of the group's latest projects, the design behind the new restaurant. It was not that we strategically decided that this area needed us, it was purely and simply that our core business was getting smaller and we wanted to sell more services to the same kind of people. The same marketing people are involved in this process as would be involved in producing a brochure for example, but we can offer them more and actually funnily enough they see more value in it because it is more of a hands-on start to finish type of project and it's great to come to a place like this and see almost finished what we started off with which was effectively ideas being sketched on a page. One of the biggest things I've found about business is that the only people who really like change are babies with dirty nappies. Every other person you meet will say, I'm all for change as long as it doesn't involve me. And I think every one of us need to get to the stage where we go, actually change is good. In our business we've changed so much that I can't even recognise where we came from sometimes. Each Saturday morning, the boardroom gives way to a walk in Wicklow with Dad Jim and son William. But business is never more than a stone's throw away when you come from an entrepreneurial family. My dad basically started as a clerk up the road there in Fassero Quarry and worked his way up to run CRH and grew it from 60 million turnover to a billion turnover. So he was one of the most successful businessmen in the 70s and the 80s and uh, he hasn't lost any of his acumen. The hardest thing to do in Ireland in such a small market, in my opinion, is to create a business from nothing and succeed with that business for 25 years, which is what Colin has done. And so every Saturday morning I get grilled on my business decisions of the week and so when everyone else, particularly my competitors, are probably taking a breather from a very hard week at work, I get to basically go over the entire week again. If the leader of an organisation isn't passionate and isn't really bringing energy to the party, I don't really see their benefit of being around at all. I'm glad to say I still get up every morning and can't wait to get to work. For 30 years, civil engineers, M&M contractors have been helping maintain Ireland's infrastructure. Belfast-based, but growing in the UK also, the managerial heavy lifting is done by CEO Gareth Loy, who starts each day in the gym. Get up at 10 past 5, get some breakfast, watch the business news, and then head here, get here for 6 a.m., um, stay for 30 minutes and then head to work. I enjoy this time of the morning uh, because it's, my phone doesn't ring and it's nice and quiet. It's my half hour. That's, that's the importance of the, the gym, that's the importance, it's my bit of headspace. Waiting at 85 kilos, Gareth Lloyd. A mixed martial arts practitioner in his younger days, Gareth competed in six professional fights 
culminating in a prize fight before a crowd of thousands in the King's Hall. The King's Hall was a fantastic experience, you know, the fight in front of 2,500 people, but ultimately cage fighting and MMA wasn't my natural way. I'm not really a fighter, but I enjoyed the, the technical experience, I enjoyed the people I worked with and trained with, and it was a brilliant experience. I suppose in life itself I enjoy taking challenges on, but probably to the extreme, whether that be to my own detriment, I'm not so sure. But I like to see how far I can take it and how far I can go as a, as, as a person. Because ultimately I want to understand how far my abilities will go. You do the same in business, and in business I look to see how far I can stretch myself and stretch the company. Garrett's career ambitions always lay with the family business he leads today. While Garrett's rise has been swift, his dad, who still works in m and made sure he worked his way up. He didn't start in the office the first day. <laughs> he started in the trench like everybody else. In fact, I, I took him the first day and nobody knew who he was. And I, I says, go in there and start digging. And uh, then it was about two or three weeks before they realised he was my son. <laughs> and the only reason they realised because they seen a pair of jeans he had on and said that I had worn them at some time. <laughs> so that's how they found out. So after that, um, he just kept moving up, you know. From 10 employees to 170 and from a turnover of less than 2 million to 24 million pounds, M&M has been on a firm footing since Gareth took the reins just six years ago. You learn everything. You learn how to uh, do all the work. You learn what's possible, what's not possible, what's risky. You learn how to communicate ultimately. You learn how to work with everybody. Uh, and I think that's really important and that's probably been the key to our success. Running a business is a marathon, not a sprint. And for Gareth and wife Laura, whom he first met at the gym, fitness often bookends busy days. For some people it might be, I don't know, go for a drink, you know, go for a coffee. For us probably it's to hit the gym, unfortunately, for an hour or so, but yeah. So it's just, it's a big part of, yeah, both our lives and always has been. Look it is, that's, that's where I first met Laura, was at the gym and, you know, that's, that's what, our eyes met thing. across treadmills, as you dad <laughs> say. <laughs> I'm not really sure I understand the term entrepreneur, but I, I know I'm not a businessman. A businessman comes to work every day and does business things. I come to work every day to grow a business and look for new products and new angles and new ways of developing the business. And I suppose if that's entrepreneurship, then I would class myself as an entrepreneur. Next week, plain sailing in the plastics business, Cool Pharma in the sunny southeast. A new outlook on how medicine is delivered. Putting the taxi business back in the fast lane. And a crowning achievement in the kingdom. Mm -hmm.